Hey there, welcome to uh, chapter 2.2. We're talking about Virginia and the establishment of other colonies. We're going to wrap this up today uh, for chapter 2, which is a nice introduction to England uh, and their colonization of the New World, which directly and indirectly leads to the formation of the United States. So, John Rolfe, the guy who married Pocahontas and was killed in the first Pahatan War, uh, he's the father of the tobacco industry in Virginia. You, you, all you smokers that are having lung cancer, you can probably sue his relatives right there. He's the one that got you, got you all sick. Probably shouldn't have smoked anyway. Uh, he perfected his methods by 1612 to quench a huge demand for tobacco in Europe. This was the crop that saved the Virginia colonies. It saved Jamestown because finally they were making money. They didn't really care about survival and you know domination really as much. They just wanted money. And tobacco in Europe, everyone was all the rage. They're like, man, if you try this new thing called tobacco, this is a woman's voice, by the way. This is amazing. I mean, I just, you smoke it, you feel great. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this. Nothing's ever going to kill us. <coughs> See, even talking about smoking makes you <coughs> cough. It made Virginia profitable, and I clicked everything off. Uh, Jamestown planted so much, they actually had to import their food. Uh, they had to buy food from other places. There wasn't a city market yet, or a King Supers. Uh, so they had to import food, but they could afford it because they're making so much money in tobacco. Everybody's smoking in Europe. It's awesome, smoking. Morons. Colonists now wanted their own land. They didn't want to stay in the confines of Jamestown. They wanted to plant their own tobacco and make their own money. And you get the spirit of capitalism and money making and entrepreneurship and, you know, breaking land and, you know, homesteading that really kind of defines America for a long time. Uh, tobacco, not only is it bad for you, don't smoke kids, uh, it's bad for the soil. It requires a lot of labor, a lot of work, which you know, we're all a little lazy sometimes. Uh, and it's also the subject to price fluctuations. It goes up and down based on supply and demand. Should have paid attention more in economics. You would understand that fully. Um, and to meet that labor demand, unfortunately, the first African slaves arrived in 1619 via um, the Portuguese, uh, which starts the legacy that is kind of the, the coiled snake underneath the table of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of our country. Uh, of slavery, um, which we can't escape our past, uh, and but this is where it was started, was tobacco plantations. Many used white indentured servants though. Um, you could work for basically free for seven years and then, you know, and that was a part of your voyage, and then you were free to live in the new world after seven years. So many whites, many of those poor that were, uh, you know, in the enclosure movement in England, living in the cities, this was a way, an opportunity for them to, to actually gain land, their own land, which is impossible in England to do. Um, you also have representative government born the same year. We're getting the seedlings of the United States. Uh, the first representative body in American history was in Virginia. It was called the House of Burgesses. Um, and it was the first body of, of people to make laws for the, for the citizens that are, or people living in Virginia. Um, James the first though grew distrustful of Virginia because they were kind of doing their own thing and he kind of lost control over it uh, and he wasn't really enjoying that so he revoked, revoked their charter in 1624 but there's like 3,000 miles away so they still kind of did their own thing let's get to the next one here we go uh, Maryland Mary had a little land and its capital was Annapolis Founded in 1634 by George Calvert, Lord Baltimore, pictured there. Uh, Lord Baltimore wanted a safe haven for Catholics in England to go to. Uh, which, you know, for a lot of the English is, hey, we can get rid of the Catholics. Cool, let them go. Um, because there, there's a lot of religious tension going on there. Uh, he wanted profits. I mean, who doesn't? Uh, and a safe haven for the Catholics. His son, Cecilius, was the one who actually ran the colony. Lord Calvert, Lord Baltimore, ever actually set foot in Maryland, but they named the, you know, the city after him, um, you know, the major port city. Uh, 200 settlers arrived in Maryland. They planted tobacco, but they had to grow food too. They learned from the mistakes of Virginia. So for every so many acres of tobacco you planted, you've got to have some food too. You know, we got to eat. You can't, you can't survive on tobacco. You can't combine it with tomatoes and make tobacco like Homer Simpson tried. 
Uh, there was huge Catholic estates that would clash with these small farmers. So you have these giant plantations, these rich, rich, rich Catholic people, and then you have the small-time farmers, and they don't really get along. Uh, and there's a lot of tension in Maryland early in its, in its existence. Um, they did promise 100 acres to each male settler. There's a little typo there, I apologize. 100 acres for his wife and 50 for each kid. So if you were a promiscuous couple and you were very uh, fertile, you could have a lot of land from having a lot of kids, which if you have a lot of land, you need a lot of kids to work it. So for instance, my wife and I, we have three kids. We could have, we do a little quick math, 350 acres of land, which that, that's a lot. I, I think I definitely need a tractor for that. Uh, the need for labor grew, though, with those huge tracts of land and that much and, and, and tobacco and so more and more indentured servants were being brought in, and Maryland also brings in slaves. Uh, there's the Maryland state flag, which combined the uh, you know, the, the flags of, of the, the Calvert family, and I don't remember the other one, my mind's slipping me right now. Uh, Lord Baltimore permitted freedom of worship from the start. Even though it was a Catholic haven, Maryland sets the precedent of religious freedom in this country. Um, the irony is, you know, in the next chapter, we're going to learn about the Puritans and um, they came here for religious freedom, then didn't grant it to anybody. Uh, but in Maryland, that's really where the seedlings of our First Amendment, uh, religious freedom, come from, is they allowed people to worship however they wanted. Um, there was a heavy tide of Protestant settlers that kind of threatened the Catholic friends, and, and so it was seen as a, an act to really allow the Catholics to worship. Uh, it's called the Act of Toleration. It was passed in 1649 by the, the, the men who lived in, in Maryland. So you're seeing the representative government once again. You're seeing religious freedom. You're seeing, the, you know, where the United States has our heritage. And so they guaranteed freedom, guaranteed freedom to uh, of religion to all Christians, uh, Muslims and Jews and atheists and people that worship trees and stuff apparently weren't included. Uh, and the city of Baltimore was founded in 1729. Um, it's still the major, biggest city of Maryland. It's not the capital, though, um, but it's a big port city. Very interesting place. We'll, we'll come back to Baltimore for sure. Uh, in the Caribbean, in the south, uh, you know, south of the United States, you have the West Indies. Spain was slowly losing its grip on the Caribbean. Spain's slowly losing its grip on the New World. They're having major problems after the failure of the Spanish Armada. Uh, you have a Dutch war. You know, don't fight the Dutch. Overextension, wasteful spending, you know, they bought, you know, gold-plated shoes, I don't know. Uh, and then the, Eng the English are starting to establish colonies on the islands that, that they could take over in the Caribbean. Uh, they established a colony in Jamaica in 1655. Uh, and, and really, the Caribbean, the West Indies, were the profitable colonies in the New World. Even though tobacco made a lot of money, English money was really, the profits were being made in the Caribbean. Because sugar was the other thing that um, Europeans were addicted to. What a healthy society. Man, tobacco, sugar, they're drinking all the time. I mean, they drank beer for breakfast because the water would kill you. Uh, and sugar was in high demand. Um, whereas tobacco was a poor man's crop, sugar cane was the opposite. This was for the rich, this is for the elite, this was for the corporations uh, or these joint stock companies. They needed lots of labor and lots of capital, so you had to bring in more African slaves, and it sets up that, you know, just that uh, legacy of slavery in the New World to work these um, very, very arduous task of, of, you know, cutting and raising sugar cane. By 1700, African slaves actually outnumbered the Englishmen in the Caribbean, uh, and so to make sure they kept them in line, they passed the Barbados Slave Code of 1661, uh, which was used to keep slaves in line. Uh, we mentioned that because a lot of those things were mimicked here in the United States uh, with the slaves codes that were eventually put in place. Uh, they, divide, they denied fundamental rights to slaves. Uh, and the West Indies later depended on foodstuffs from the mainland of America because they're too busy planting sugarcane. And so you get the, the beginnings of what we're going to call a triangle trade. And we'll, we'll talk about that in later chapters in detail. Uh, in the Carolinas... Uh, colonization was interrupted in the 1600s. Everything was going great until the English Civil War, in which Parliament rose up against Charles I, and because he wanted money, and you have the Rump Parliament, all that, and then they eventually chop his head off, and you have you have Oliver Cromwell takes over, and it's just a big mess. I mean, England is a big mess. 
Uh, Charles I was beheaded in 1649. Oliver Cromwell ruled as Lord Protectorate, which is like quasi king, till 1659. And then when he died, they kind of messed around for a few years, and then they decided, let's just go back to what we used to do. Uh, and they brought back Charles II in 1660, uh, which is the restoration of uh, of England. And it kind of was a pause, you know, a lot of violence, chopping off the king's head. Uh, um, and colonization kind of slowed until then. There were two charters, though, given to Charles' eight-member court, uh, Charles II, that is. Uh, and in 1663 and 1665, they established Charles's land, which in Latin, the Latinized version was Carolina. Um, each set up large estates and had ties to the West Indies, these eight member court, huge estates. And then this was seen as a place to grow food for the West Indies. They were trading, you know, and they set up these new plantations. They also imported African slaves and even exported Native American slaves to the rest of the Indies and back to England. Uh, Charlestown, which would become the capital, or kind of the main port there, was founded in 1670. Charlestown, named after Charles II, eventually be shortened into Charleston, because Southerners like to say things combined, y'all. Rice became the principal crop in the South, though, um, which would be to become South Carolina, and North Carolina, tobacco being the key. And so you're starting to see the division between all of Carolina to North and South. North Carolina was founded by poor outcast and religious dissenters. Uh, newcomers were often squatters on the land. They just show up and do whatever they wanted. Uh, they didn't actually have a charter and they just took over the land and there was really no one there to enforce it. Uh, rebellious people develop a strong sense of resistance and, and North Carolina becomes legendary for being stubborn and rebellious and kind of outcast. Um, you know, I have a picture here of, the, of their college mascot, the, the Tar Heels, uh, which actually comes from the Civil War, but they were so stubborn, they would not retreat that the, the Northerners and even other Southerners said that they had tar on their heels because they were stuck uh, and they refused to back up. Uh, the location between aristocratic Virginia and South Carolina kind of strengthened this, uh, and they really didn't like being surrounded by all these uppity uh, aristocrats, and so North Carolina very rebellious. Um, friction between the governors um, led to the formal split of the Carolinas in 1712. And so you get North Carolina, go Tar Heels, or if you're a Duke fan, whatever, or Wake Forest or NC State. I mean, it's, it's basketball central. Uh, and then you got South Carolina, the Gamecocks. Uh, remember, North Carolina and Duke are separated, I believe, by seven or eight miles and, and a shade of blue. I keep hitting the wrong button. Man, I'm an idiot. Uh, both became royal colonies. Uh, North Carolina, though, its legacy is it's the most most democratic, where the people had the biggest vo voice. Uh, it was the most independent and the least aristocratic of any colony except for the absolute rebel, Rhode Island. And, you know, they have little man syndrome because they're little and they're like, hey, man, listen to me. I'm Rhode Island. Come on, man. Um, they did share on the ongoing fight with the Native Americans, though, just because they were, well, they were more independent. They didn't... Uh, they weren't as ni they weren't nice to the natives either. Uh, the Tuscarora, that's hard to say, Indians attacked the settlers in New Bern in 1711. Uh, the Tuscarora War, I know I'm saying that wrong, witnessed the tribe being crushed and sold into slavery. And so you're seeing the theme of natives resisting, being crushed, and their culture being wiped out. Um, they eventually became the sixth nation of the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, the South Carolinian, Carolinians defeated the Yamasee Indians later on, um, and by 1720, virtually all coastal Native Americans were removed by the encroaching whites. And then you have Georgia. Georgia, well, yeah, I do. Founded in 1733 as a buffer or a protection area between Spanish Florida and the French in Louisiana, um, it was originally started um, as a poor people colony, actually. Uh, James Oglethorpe, pictured here, one of the colony for English debtors. People that were in debt, if you owed money, you could be thrown in jail back then. And so they offered a fresh start to the poor. Um, Savannah became this eclectic, bustling port for people to come to. Um, they did some peculiar things, though. They didn't fit with the other colonies. They banned slavery, which in the South was unheard of. They banned Catholics, which... You're seeing a lot of anti-Catholicism with a lot of the English. They banned lawyers, which is probably a good idea. 
Unless you're a lawyer watching this, sorry. And they even banned rum, which, come on, what are you supposed to drink in America at that time? There's, the water will kill you. That's all they had. It, it's kind of like a trailer park um, of the colonies. The 13th colony is Georgia, and it's kind of the trailer park. Nothing wrong with that. I grew up in the trailer park, I understand. Um, but, you know, sometimes people need to kick back a few just to feel better about themselves. Uh, it remained relatively small without a large plantation system. Not really a major player until really right up before the American Revolution. Uh, and even then, it, it's really a smaller colony, even into the 1800s. Uh, in the plantation colonies, you have Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia had a lot in common. They're the South. You know, we're, so we're talking, we're, we're, we're laying the foundation for not only the United States, we're also laying the foundation for the Civil War. Uh, I know that seems like a long ways off. We haven't even found the country yet. But the legacy of the Civil War and what's going on starts with how these colonies are founded and what they had uh, in commonality. Um, they exported commercial agricultural products. Cotton is not around yet. It wasn't a profitable uh, crop to grow. And so they're growing tobacco. They're growing rice. In South Carolina, they're growing indigo, which is a dye that you know, we use in blue jeans. Uh, they're growing foodstuffs. Uh, tobacco and rice were their cash crops that they're selling. Um, they're also selling food to uh, the, you know, the, the West Indies, the Caribbean. They all had slavery except Georgia from 1733 to 1750. Georgia finally lifted that ban. I think they also lifted their ban on rum. You have large plantations that dominate the landscape, uh, except in North Carolina and Georgia. It's kind of a, they have more of the small farm, you know, the average, you know, we would say middle class, but it's not really a middle class yet, um, which because it's so spread out. Because people have large tracts of land, it hinders the growth of cities, which hinders the growth of industry, which, you know, is a legacy of the South um, that eventually helps them lose the Civil War. They don't have the, the, the production needed to win a huge war like the North would. They don't have education like the North would because they're just too spread out. It's more difficult for them to form uh, schools because they're not living in towns or they're more isolated. Um, they all permitted some form of religious tolerance, which cannot be said about the North to start. Uh, and the Church of England was the dominant uh, faith in the South. Here are your southern colonies. Um, they went basically to the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, you can see where they grew tobacco, uh, where they grew rice and indigo, some timber, some naval supplies, furs and skins, cattle and grain. That's the dirty, dirty South. Answer these questions if you want. Hope you enjoyed chapter two. We'll be moving on to chapter three when we talk about the Puritans who wore buckles on their hats. See you later.